Laura, we're here at the Salzburg Global Seminar talking about breaking the glass ceiling. Mm -hmm. You're an expert on women in power around the world and women in business too. We've seen many evidences of women gaining power. Uh, the new president of Argentina, other places, Hillary Clinton running in, in uh, possibly being the presidential nominee in the United States. Why are we still talking about breaking the glass ceiling? Well, I think we're talking about breaking that glass ceiling um, because the fact of the matter is that if you actually look at the real numbers of women at these highest levels of leadership in whatever area you're talking about, you're still seeing a few. I mean, because even if you looked at uh, uh, de Kirchner, Christina de Kirchner of um, Argentina or Ellen Johnson Sirleaf of Liberia, you know, Michelle Bachelet of um, Chile, you know, even the potential of a first woman president in the United States, uh, you're still looking at a very small number. Mm -hmm. You know, you're still looking at maximum maybe eight sitting leaders out of a total of what? How many countries? 190. You know, and in some countries you have to double that. You're talking about both the president and the prime minister. Mm -hmm. You know, and that could be a woman can be there one of those slots. So we're still really talking about a very small number. Of course, as I have said before in the Salzburg seminar, I actually don't believe it's a it's a glass ceiling. It really is just a thick layer of men. <laughs> Um, yes, indeed. Uh, what is the link between um, women in power in business and women in power in, um, in politics? You know, I don't know if there's necessarily a link that is, you know, can we say, well, in a country where there are a large number of women in the business sector, can you see a correlative number of women in, in the government sector and public sector? Um, in some countries, it seems that the, uh, what I call the tailwinds and the headwinds are different. You know, in the case, for example, of the Nordic countries, where there's a long tradition of equality, and also as you know, men went out to sea as fishermen and things like that, um, you'll find that the public sector is really quite amenable to women, and they've also had affirmative mechanisms in place for quite a long time. So, if you look at the public sector, you'll actually see quite a large number of women at the highest levels, critical mass and beyond. Um, but then, when you actually look at the, at the private sector the business sector, actually in, in the Nordic countries you won't see very much success for women. There are certainly some women, uh -huh. but you know, it's been in the hands of, of families for a very long time, right. very consolidated power, and you actually don't see all of that much. Conversely, in the United States, it's more likely that you're going to see a little bit more of women at least rising to certain levels within organizations, corporate organizations, but you're going to see less of that in the public sector because you know, there are, not, there are no real sort of institutional boosters because, of course, the United States has no sort of affirmative mechanisms in place, whereas there have been affirmative me mechanisms in place in the corporate, in the corporate yeah. world, so, or at least uh, the potential corporate. I see the link. Let's actually talk a little bit about affirmative mechanisms because we've discussed women in parliaments around the world and where they reach critical mass. I think you, you spoke about how any time they've reached um, critical mass, there's been some mm -hmm. quota, goal, something to put them there. Can you elaborate a little bit on sure, that? Sure, and this is not my research by any means. This is a woman named Pippa Norris out of the Kennedy School at Harvard, where she has looked at all the kinds of affirmative mechanisms there are, and there, there are many of them, there are many kinds. You can have a constitutional mandate, you can have um, a certain number of parity requirements in a political party, you can have fines, you can, I mean, there's all sorts of ways you can do this kind of thing. You can have mm -hmm. every other person be of the opposite sex on a party list. Mm -hmm. There's many, many ways um, that this can go. But what she has identified is that in her research that no country does get to critical mass without some affirmative mechanisms in place. And which is why you see change much more rapidly. I mean, Rwanda has a constitutional requirement, you know, of 50-50 almost, almost, and they're number, I think they're number one or number two now in terms of percentage of women in the parliament. Uh -huh. Whereas Sweden is either number one or number two, you know, because they've long had these kinds of things. Okay. You mentioned some other research in your in your conversation here about women and how women. Um, calculate their risks in a different way than men do and how they treat themselves as, or their achievements as being a matter of luck mm -hmm. more than a matter of achievement. I, I wish you would elaborate a little bit about that and also about whether we're socialized that way or whether that's innate. Yeah. I, mean, I think it is, I, I will have to say, I think a lot of it is socialization. It's hard to know uh, the answer to the nature-nurture 
question. Mm -hmm. You know, to me, a asking the nature nurture question is is like asking what's more important in a rectangle, uh -huh. the short line or the long line. Right. It has, you have no answer. Yes. You have no answer. I know that there are some traits I believe of the historically underrepresented groups uh, that are traits that come from being underrepresented. And so the kinds of things you're talking about, for example, women's belief basically, it's, it's known in sociologist terms as men having what's known as positive illusion, which is the sense that they are quite good, you know, and that, that that reinforces themselves. And they will actually listen very closely for the positive and reinforce their sense of confidence. It's a great trait. Mm -hmm. But women have what's known as negative illusion, which is I'm likely to hear the negative in mm -hmm. something and therefore think that I'm not really quite as good as I thought. So in this case, for example, women um, will say that, you know, oh, this was just luck for the success or uh, my team did such a good job, you know. Um, but if something fails, then they'll say, well, obviously something that I did made it fail. Or didn't do. Or didn't do, <laughs> yes. sure. Um, but for the men, it's quite the opposite. It's that if it's successful, well, clearly my skill sets and, you know, were one, were the one of the reasons, if not the major reason, why I was successful. And if it didn't fail, it's external factors that created the failure. Now, you know, what I'd like to see is men have perhaps a little less of the positive and women have a little less of the negative because the truth lies someplace in between. Mm -hmm. But, of course, society does not let women express ambition in the same way that men can express ambition. And so for a woman to say, well, yes, I did a great job, is, is, is a little too far out of the gender norm that we expect. Women know that intuitively, and then they, so they pull back from that. But the problem with it is, psychologically, it doesn't help you. Right. So is there any advice that you can give to women to overcome mm -hmm. that negative illusion, positive illusion sure. problem? Well, first and foremost, if someone gives you a compliment about a job well done, you say thank you. And also, excuse me, taking some risks, you know, and saying, okay, I've risked this. And usually, generally speaking, because women always tend to feel like they have to be much better prepared than men, they're likely to be successful Yes. if they do take those risks. Yes. Share with us those numbers about um, women's ability or willingness to take a risk on what they Well, know. it's more like women feel like that they uh, are fully informed of something. Uh, when they have 75% of the knowledge. And men feel basically they're fully informed with something when they have about 25% of the knowledge. Uh, I remember when I was in business school at Harvard and, uh, um, you know, it's a very case study oriented kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And you'd be in the classroom and I had to admire this. It was a great trait for men. You know, a man would raise his hand and say, well, you know, I haven't actually read the case, but I have an answer. <laughs> and you're thinking to yourself, how do you do that? Yes. You know? <laughs> yes. I want to put a finer point to this, to that, to that extent that because women are over-scrutinized, yes, and the indeed. standard by which they're measured is a different standard, you actually, Judy, cannot get away with saying, I don't know. Yes. As often as a man can get away with saying, I don't know, I'll find out the answer. Yes. So the fact of the matter is there's an intuitive acknowledgement that that standard is, is higher, and therefore women will have to feel, and will have, will have to be more prepared. Do they have to be as prepared sometimes as I think? I mean, I've, I've had women say, oh, I'm not ready to take that promotion yet. It, which, which, when I hear that, I say, no, stop. No, exactly. <laughs> Is there any way out of this psychologically? How do we change this psychology? Yeah, I think it comes with having power. I think it comes with having, you know, the experiences of it. I think it comes with seeing the success that you have. I think it also just comes with the acknowledgement that it's not pathological to you that these things are going on. Yes. That if you are the only O in a room full of X's, you're going to be over-scrutinized. And then it takes the sting away from, this isn't really about me, this is about the dynamic of what's going on in the room. And once I know that that's the dynamic, well, you know, I can either engage in that dynamic or not engage in that dynamic. Mm -hmm. How do you see these issues playing out in the next few years? In terms of women? Uh, yes. Well, I mean, I think just this kinds of, these kinds of seminars, um, are, which are really, I think, very reinforcing for women and the kind of networking. I mean, it's always very good to share these kinds of similar experiences. You know, I mean, I would like to be able, as I've been saying, to hurry history and make it happen faster. Um, will it? I'm not so sure. Uh, but I think things like there might be incremental jumps where you have the role model, for example, of a woman president, or you, you see a woman secretary of state, or you see, you know, a 
minister of defense or something like that. These are all things that actually sort of, they notch us up a little bit more quickly. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for a wonderful interview and actually for running this seminar the way you run it. Thank you. Thank you, Judy.